Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to be here to uh, uh, present some uh, research that I'm doing. So my name is Bruno Turnheim. I'm a researcher at the LISIS, Laboratoire Interdisciplinaire Science, Innovation, Société. So it's primarily about the sociology of technology and innovation. Uh, we deal with questions of environment and questions of uh, socio-technical systems, innovations and transitions primarily. Voilà, so today I'll present uh, a little bit of theory on the destabilization of socio-technical systems and I'll illustrate with a case study from the historical dismantling of tramways in France, so that's beginning of the uh, 20th century. So the talk today is primarily uh, structures as follows, so a quick introduction, then uh, carving out how and why destabilization is a research problem of interest, uh, propose some element of framing, uh, conceptual framing, then the case study, then further illustrations, and some conclusions. So uh, most of this work is based on these two public, two books, um, The Great Reconfiguration that I wrote with Frank Hills, uh, an edited volume that we uh, edited on technologies in decline, where really this question of what do we deal with uh, how do we deal with technologies that are declining or that might be on the way out or where we might want them to be on the way out? Think of coal, nuclear, uh, pesticides, etc. And a very recent paper published uh, last week in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, specifically on this case. So most of this research comes out of uh, this uh, Ways Out project that I lead, which is about the governance of destabilization pathways and phase out pathways uh, that seeks to pluralize the knowledge uh, that is convened on these issues uh, in support of deliberate low carbon or sustainability transition governance. And so I lead this project with colleagues from LISIS, uh, so my lab, but also colleagues from CIRED, which is a primarily a modeling, economic modeling lab in uh, the east of Paris. And this research is funded by the Programme d'Investissement d'Avenir. Okay, first transition. So I guess uh, some of your courses deal with transitions, but, but what are we uh, talking about? Uh, the first observation is that the notion, the problem of transition has erupted in society. Uh, there is a pluralization of transition talk, transition objectives, whether this concerns agriculture, energy, digital transitions, etc. All of this can be quite confusing. Institutionally, we have uh, in a number of countries, including France, now ministries of transition. So in France, the Ministère de la Transition Écologique et Solidaire, so ecological and solidary transitions, now uh, reframed in recent years, Ministry of Ecological Transition and aptly or interestingly reframed in uh, the wake of climate marches, as you could see on this picture uh, by some activists as min Ministry of the Solitary Transition. So that indicates us already uh, how this is a question uh, of a uh, con uh, contested issue, an issue for democracy and an issue that uh, uh, yeah, is politicized. So why then are transitions a uh, problem for the social sciences? I'd like to argue that uh, transitions are both a research object as well as a political and a governance object. So transitions and transformations, whichever uh, perspective we take, a socio-technical, a socio-ecological, a socio-economic, a modeling perspective, are uh, by these various disciplines and fields of study uh, uh, framed as phenomena with particular attributes. Transitions are very long-term processes of change uh, from one particular configuration to another. Uh, to fulfill a particular societal function, heating, uh, powering, lighting, feeding, providing health, etc. Uh, there are a number of fields of research that take transitions as an object. object. My particular field is transition studies, where these questions are really central, but also economic modeling, energy modeling, modeling in different sectors, 
uh, political uh, science, uh, historical sociology, the history of technology and science and technology studies have uh, in recent years taken transitions and processes of transformation as their object. The main objective there, uh, at least uh, phenomenologically, is to understand what are these transitions, how can we frame them, how can we make them understandable, how can we make them uh, governable, how can we make them evaluable, e evaluatable, sorry, and how can we explain uh, contemporary situations, whether we see change or lack of change. So for me, uh, non-transition, the frustrations of not seeing these desired transitions uh, uh, unfolding or happening is also a problem for transitions and an interesting one. Why are we not seeing the change that we might want to see? We, or uh, some uh, social actors. Transitions have also become an object of politics and governance. As I alluded in my previous slides, there's a proliferation of transition discourses, of motives, of uh, transition claims, uh, as well as dedicated interventions, policy interventions, business interventions, uh, social movement interventions to get uh, established, uh, entrenched systems to change. Uh, there's an issue of instrumentality and instrumentation. How do we, how does society, how do decision makers, uh, how do various social actors uh, act to make change happen? Uh, how can we support transitions in the making and how would we know that uh, transitions are happening? Voilà. And uh, the second aspect of, of the governance of transitions puts uh, social science into a little bit of a pickle uh, because of course uh, many social science traditions uh, have a critical engagement uh, with the world and so there uh, there is a bit of an ambivalence uh, should the researcher, should the scientist work to support transitions or to deconstruct uh, discourses, uh, power positions, etc. Possibly both, but these two hermeneutics, as, as one might say, uh, have to be re reconciled in, in research practice. So what if we take transitions as a problem of research for the social sciences, I, I'd like to uh, suggest that we are dealing with some of the fundamental problems of social sciences. How to explain the tension, contradictions between stability and change. How to explain that socio-technical systems in the approach that I'll put forward are not changing. How to explain that they are so inert so resistant to change, uh, how do we explain that they might in certain circumstances uh, be transformed? So that's the tension between stability and change. Uh, a second one which runs deep in the social sciences is the uh, problem of structure and agency and I'll simplify it here. Do, in this case, socio-technical systems and their structuring determine our ability uh, to change and to act? Am I as an individual or are we as collectives uh, victims of the way society is structured and hence is our uh, ability to act and change things limited or on the, the other hand do we actually have the capacity to transform the very structures that condition our actions and this is really one of the fundamental problems of social sciences and it doesn't have a simple uh, answer uh, it's always a situated answer it's a uh, it depends, and it depends on the conditions, and then we can study the mechanisms that might uh, allow us to uh, 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 address some of these questions in context. Another very important uh, question is how do I handle these huge questions of transitions? Uh, what are the appropriate scales, uh, levels of structure, or the different spaces in which I may observe this inertia, this stability, and uh, the possibilities for change. Again, huge questions for the social sciences. Uh, and lastly, a more political one, uh, are transitions uh, empowering? Empowering more uh, social justice, for instance? Or 
do, do these uh, 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 deep structural changes that transitions are, tend, do they tend to reproduce existing forms of inequality uh, and injustice? And again, there's no simple answer to any of these questions, but I want to mention that uh, these are fundamental. Well, yes? What do, mean, what do you mean by social technology? I'll come to that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so how do we think through transitions as a social technical issue? Um, and I'll come to this in the various uh, coming uh, slides. Uh, the first First, I want to uh, suggest a starting point. So one is rooted in two observations. So large systems of energy provision or food provision or mobility provisions uh, have been observed to be inert. They're very stable. Car-based system, as much as we see small changes occurring, is a very stable system that is entrenched in, in uh, everything we do. It, up to the way uh, cities are shaped. On the other hand, uh, the second observation is that changing these systems could, and that was uh, uh, attempted in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, could be changed by uh, small incremental changes, a catalytic converter on uh, the back of a car uh, to uh, reduce the air pollution uh, uh, from exhaust pipes. Uh, but we also observe that Deep transformations will not happen through incremental system optimizations because these system is, uh, optimizations are, uh, have a, a, a glass ceiling, if you want. So these two observations lead uh, the field and many other fields to argue that fundamental transformations of production and consumption systems are needed. And the transitions literature suggests that there are three fundamental mechanisms for uh, such transformation to occur. Something new has to emerge. Ideally something radically new and, and uh, significantly alternative. These, something, these new things, ways of doing, ways of thinking have to stabilize and become mainstreamed in society. And, and this is the topic for today, existing systems confronted to some of their uh, fundamental problems become destabilized. Now, destabilization doesn't necessarily lead to the decline of systems. It, these systems can become transformed, but uh, voila. And these three processes are not in a sequence. It's not one after the other. They're actually usually very uh, uh, um, connected to each other. Destabilization may precede the emergence of alternatives and vice versa. <laughs> And most likely the combination of these patterns of emergence, stabilization and destabilization will determine the patterns of transition that we can observe in a particular system. And I'll come now to the socio-technical uh, problem in a, in a few minutes, if you can uh, hold to that. So why then uh, is this particular uh, process of destabilization interesting? Um, Firstly, we observe that destabilization, decline, the dismantling, the phase out, the discontinuation of existing systems has become the object of political claims, objects of governance, whether this concerns uh, uh, the observation of persistent environmental problems that need to be dealt with, or health problems that need to be dealt with, or other types of of framings of the undesirability of systems. So here it is an illustration of the um, uh, campaign to remove lead, uh, lead sorry, from uh, petroleum uh, uh, products, campaigns to keep fossil fuels, and in this case, coal in the ground uh, to uh, 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 reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, campaigns to uh, um, uh, phase out nuclear power, campaigns to uh, exit or to remove pesticides from agricultural production, but also campaigns in the uh, prohibition times, for instance, backed up then with uh, government re leg uh, regulations to uh, uh, remove alcohol from society yeah. or to defund the police uh, uh, more recently. So there are claims out there and there are uh, uh, mobilization to reduce, remove uh, or phase out uh, systems. 
I will argue that destabilization is a problem that uh, um, can be framed at a ver variety of different uh, system levels. So uh, my uh, interest is in socio-technical systems, so very large uh, systems uh, of uh, provision of particular societal functions, uh, whether this is this, the coal-based systems for the ener energy production, conventional farming for uh, uh, the production of, uh, of food and agricultural pro products, um, civil uh, aviation for uh, long-distance uh, passenger travel or also goods, uh, goods uh, travel, uh, whaling for the, pr pr um, for the supply of fat and sources of uh, oil for lighting, etc., etc. One can be interested in destabilization of specific actors rather than systems, targeting a specific industry and their uh, representatives, targeting specific unions uh, because they are resisting uh, claims for change, uh, or particular uh, industry representatives and lobbyists, for instance. Destabilization and phase out can also uh, be targeted at specific artifacts, things, or substances. Uh, for instance, DDT, a powerful uh, pesticide that has been banned from agricultural uses. Pesticides uh, that have not <laughs> in their entirety been banned from agricultural uh, use. Plastic bags, etc. etc. Uh, we can be interested in the problem of destabilization as far as knowledge uh, regimes are uh, uh, concerned. For instance, particular forms of expertise might be uh, facing uh, challenges as to their legitimacy and their normal functioning. Of course, we've all heard of uh, crises as disruptive events and moments that uh, put into question the viability of existing systems, uh, more often than not uh, uh, followed by a return to normal. Uh, we've, we've also all uh, experienced after COVID, for instance, but sometimes claimed to be uh, sources of the acceleration of transformations. Uh, to illustrate this question of the different level of analysis, I just want to point that ending a specific substance is very different from ending an entire socio-technical system. So the history of uh, the DDT ban, uh, which was the object of contestation in the 50s and eventually led to American ban in the 70s and international uh, uh, in the 60s, an international convention to ban DDT from agricultural uh, production in the 70s uh, was effectively ended. Okay? There is no longer DDT in agricultural production. However, at the same time as DDT was banned, the pesticides production and use regime, and this is the second illustration, has thrived. Has thrived from a situation where regulation and the authorization of products became the new regime, the new mode of functioning of pesticides production and uh, use, uh, uh, led to significantly higher barriers to entry and uh, the concentration of industrial activity in large conglomerates with effectively the power to, to uh, fight back any attempt of uh, regulation uh, later on. Voila, so that's just a quick illustration. And here I want to talk about food and omelettes specifically. Uh, and I want to make a very simple point. So transition pathways uh, are about uh, thinking the variety of ways in which uh, transitions may happen. However, whether we look to the academic literature or to uh, the governance uh, arguments, uh, most of the, uh, let's say, energy is focused on uh, how do we bring new things to life. Renewable energy, um, uh, community uh, schemes, alternative uh, um, uh, power drives for, uh, for cars, etc. And we're pretty good, we have become pretty good at as, as a society uh, to develop new ways of doing things, you know. Uh, and I want to call these the, you know, 
the French omelette, the Japanese omelette, the rustic omelette. We, we're able to, you know, we're getting better at this and, you know, we're developing the proper equipment tailored to uh, foster these new things. Uh, and they all come in different shapes and forms and different tastes. And, uh, and that's wonderful. And we can have a, a celebration about these, these omelettes and, and we should continue. Uh, cooking uh, a, a wide range of omelettes and making them uh, more and more available to the world and more uh, palatable uh, to decision makers, to users, etc. However, uh, by doing this, we have not focused on what I claim is extremely important, is destabilization pathways. So if you follow my hypothesis that any transition involves not only making new things, but also breaking things, partially or fully, the breakage and spillage of eggs here on the floor. You do not, and the, you know, the classic adage, you do not make an omelette without breaking eggs. I think this is essential, you know. Transitions are not just wonderful, tasty omelettes. There are also a lot of breakage of eggs, a lot of ways to break eggs, uh, ways to make more or less mess when you break these eggs, uh, because Transitions involve inherently winners and losers and uh, we need to become better as a society to anticipate these issues and to also uh, minimize uh, the spillage and clean up the mess uh, after us. So this is what most of my research is about. It's about uh, understanding destabilization of a pr as a process, understanding how we break things, how we break systems. Uh, how we make this as least painful as possible, as just as possible. Uh, and this leads us to understand and observe at least a variety of patterns that can follow or outcomes that can fo follow from destabilization processes. And I've listed four here at least. A destabilization process can lead to the full decline of a system. It can lead to the partial decline of a system. It can lead to the radical transformation of a system, but it could also lead to no change, not much change at all. Voilà. So how then uh, do we understand this problem of uh, destabilization? How do I uh, suggest, uh, along with my team, to uh, uh, frame this problem? So we're uh, animated by two main questions. So first, under which conditions may established systems decline, persist, or transform in the face of destabilization pressures and contexts? So this is a conceptual issue. You know, we need new propositions and forms of explanation about the causes and the causal chains uh, for destabilization to occur. It's an empirical question. We need to vary the observation sites, sectors, uh, in historical, in contemporary cases, uh, in different geographical cases where we can observe destabilization uh, at play. Uh, it's an analytical question because we need to uh, invent the ways, the tools to describe and evaluate destabilization processes themselves. <coughs> and the second question is more of a governance question, is how can we, or as a society, actively phase out systems that have been uh, framed as undesirable, whether unsustainable or otherwise. Uh, we see, and I've alluded to this already, the multiplication of, of phase-out objectives in a variety of, of sectors. We also see limited change uh, uh, in reaction to these objectives. We see a lot of uncertainties about how to do this. Uh, as again, uh, fostering and supporting the emergence of new things, these wonderful different kinds of omelettes, is a very different problem also for governing uh, than uh, the one of breaking things and cleaning up messes. Voilà, so the question becomes how to reduce, phase out, or deal with the aftermaths of systems left behind. So how do I propose to understand destabilization? And I'm going to get to the empirical illustration uh, very soon. So uh, after a couple of years working on this, we've stabilized the definition and the definition gives us, and I've underlined and highlighted here, uh, some basic ingredients of what destabilization is, ab is about. 
a number of mechanisms that together make up almost a, an implicit model and an analytical dimension. So we define destabilization as a process, a longitudinal process, understand by this a process that uh, unfolds over extended periods of time, by which otherwise stable socio-technical regimes or configurations so, uh, become exposed to pressures significant enough to threaten their continued existence and their normal functioning. And these processes trigger strategic responses from the actors at the very core of these systems. And these strategic responses might be oriented towards preservation of the system, regime resistance to ensure continuity or transformation. So strategies to enact uh, change. Voilà. And so uh, if we sum this up, destabilization assumes that there are stable systems out there and these are become exposed uh, to uh, pressures for change. They trigger responses and these responses uh, lead uh, in, a, in a longer term to changing commitments to the reproductive features of these systems. Uh, the last point of framing, and I'll come to a bit more detail in a second, are that we understand three main dimensions of change, techno-economic dimensions, institutional and relational. So technical, techno-economic dimensions are about things, artifacts, flows of goods, markets. Institutional dimensions are about uh, sets of rules, whether these are regulations or cultural uh, norms and values. And relational uh, dimensions are about how actors are involved in, uh, uh, in stronger or weaker relations in networks, how they collide together, how they form alliances or disband alliances in processes of destabilization. And now I'll answer your question about uh, uh, how uh, we understand a socio-technical system, because of course, before understanding destabilization, we got to understand what is this stable entity. Uh, that is exposed uh, to change. So the first step, and, and I have four analytical steps to understand destabilization. So the first step is to characterize that system that we take as stable. So what is a stable socio-technical system? I want to argue that this, whether it's a pile of cars, uh, uh, or even if I had only a single car in a wa warehouse, is not a car, as far as I'm concerned. It's not uh, the car-based systems, the, the automobility socio-technical system as we understand it. For this to be a socio-technical system revolving around the car, uh, we understand and we take this from the sociology of technology, uh, socio-technical systems as configurations that work. That is, the car is embedded in a material infrastructure of roads, of alternative modes of transport embedded in uh, particular flows in uh, the city. It has a driver, it has uh, regulators, it has all sorts of rules that come to uh, make this rather crazy idea of zooming past each other at 100 kilometers an hour quite a dangerous thing to do. It normalizes this, it makes it work. You know, speed limitations, understanding that everyone has a license so I can trust my neighbor, etc., etc. And all of this is, participates to the stability of socio-technical systems on uh, the basis of an institutional uh, dimension. And this uh, uh, configuration that works is, tends to be really stable in uh, society, in history. And, uh, and and yeah, I just want to clarify that what I mean by normal functioning doesn't mean necessarily the intended functioning, but one that everyone is okay with. You know, there are traffic jams and it's an annoyance, but you know, as far as a car driver is concerned, this is just part of the normal functioning of, of a car based uh, mobility. So I've uh, pointed to these, these three dimensions, so techno-economic uh, uh, dimensions, components and flows, uh, rules, uh, rules uh, that uh, con contribute to the stabilization of these uh, regimes and actors and social groups that play the game in a way. And so any socio-technical system has to be understood uh, around these three elements and any change of socio-technical system has to be understood around these elements. And of course, the relationship between these different layers 
confers it additional stability. You can't just change uh, 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 incrementally a rule and expect that the entire system will change. So the second uh, step to study destabilization, so if we take uh, the definition seriously, is to analyze the pressures. So what kind of pressures? Again, on these three dimensions, there might be pressures, so problems to which uh, the existing system is confronted, whether that's competition from uh, alternatives, whether it's uh, market problems, supply chain problems, uh, accidents uh, that ch challenge the normal functioning or the safe functioning of a system. In terms of rules, uh, there might be challenges to the legitimacy of a uh, system. There might be uh, desires for regulating certain activities. And in terms of the relations between uh, the actors, there might be changes in the actors themselves, uh, with some actors deciding to step out of a regime to focus on another activity. And of course, when we start studying these uh, pressures, uh, we see that they are multiple, they are related, and they change over time. And so we can study also the patterns of these pressure fronts forming, a bit like a meteorologist <laughs> might look at weather patterns. Second uh, analytical element is to look at responses from, and here this is a shorthand, from the central actors of the system. So these incumbent actors are taken as particularly resourceful, powerful, and central actors in a system. If we talk again about the car-based uh, systems, these will be the automakers, uh, the automobile associations, uh, the um, uh, highway uh, uh, um, regulators, etc. And so these incumbent actors have much to lose. This is an assumption. They have much to lose to f from any change to the system. So they will be inherently uh, driven by a uh, logic to preserve their assets, preserve the, atten the advantages that they have taken decades to build, unless, unless conditions change so badly that destabilization intensifies and continuing as normal or with uh, uh, cosmetic changes is no longer tenable. Voilà. And so then in terms of responses, we can analyze a variety of responses, uh, not necessarily in this order, but often in this order, first denying problem, then resisting problems, then seeking to with, you know, continue the normal strategy with one hand, but uh, diversify with the other. And then we might see alternative path creation. So uh, industry actors, for instance, delving into completely new realms of activity. And again, these responses can be analyzed around three uh, dimensions, these three dimensions. So on economic dimensions, there are innovation strategies, market positioning strategies. On, uh, on the dimension of rules, uh, actors might you know, uh, defend uh, the reputation and legitimacy of a particular uh, uh, system, uh, engage in lobbying activity, uh, etc. And in, relation, in relational aspects, we see industry actors when the threat comes, they tend to band closer together, at least for a while. And last point, uh, changing commitments. So uh, systems are not just put there and stable as such. This stability, which we understand as dynamic stability, is, has to be continuously reproduced, continuously maintained, uh, whether this is uh, through uh, the maintenance of infrastructures, uh, the uh, repair of uh, defective uh, uh, parts or uh, technical elements, um, the uh, strategies of uh, um, crisis management when accidents do happen, etc., etc. And so this we, we, we saw this uh, two summers ago in France, quite obviously, and we see these things much more vividly in times of crises, when uh, a uh, combination of, in, of events made that the 59, out of the 59 uh, nuclear reactors in France, uh, at the end of the summer, uh, 29 were in temporary maintenance activity. And that led to quite a pressure on the energy system uh, in 2022. So now to the case, and I'm going to try to rush through this because I see that I'm already a bit... Uh, uh, um, lagging behind. So why is this? Uh, so yeah, I want to focus on the historic dismantling of electric tramways in France. So electric tramways in France were uh, um, 
at least in major cities, a huge and central part of mobility, public uh, transport infrastructure. What's interesting, and here you see the number of towns uh, with an active electric tram in various countries. Uh, what's interesting is here already you see different patterns of decline. So most countries in uh, this list, uh, France, England, Germany, Italy, Sweden, Austria, Russia, have gone undergone a significant decline of uh, their electric tramway systems. Not all fully, but France is particularly interesting because it was a full decline. Uh, Russia, for instance, or Austria has more, and Germany as well, have sort of more or less halved their, uh, their um, systems. And so we take this and try to understand how this happens. So how do we, uh, and of course, yeah, you see here very different patterns, you know. Everyone, all of these systems decline, but at different rates, at different uh, uh, scales and scopes. How do we explain then the rapid phase out of uh, French tramways and particularly tramways in Paris? This is just to illustrate how extensive the tram network was here in 1921 uh, in Paris. Not only inside Paris, but deserving all the, all up, up to, to Noisy, where my lab is, which is about 20 kilometers from Paris, a, a radial kind of uh, distribution of, of network. And I'll tell you now this story in three episodes. And for each of them, I will try to analyze the pressures, the responses, and the changing commitments. So 1900 to 1921, in terms of techno-economic pressures, we see a very rapid diffusion of electric uh, traction in tramways. Not from a blank sheet, there were tramways before, but they were house horsepower. I just want to understand what's the difference between the tramway and the metro that today? Metro is underground. Okay, so it's the main <laughs> Metro is underground, much more expensive, much heavier. Uh, and uh, at that time we had the metro. There was a metro at the same time. So that's int in interesting in itself. You have two public transport systems that are laid on top of each other. The metro only inside Paris at that time. Now it's extending a little bit outside. Here the tram served a slightly different per uh, purpose with surface transport. Uh, voilà. So that's the main, uh, but yeah, voilà. And much, much, much more expensive. So uh, we see a very rapid national diffusion of, tram, uh, of electric tram systems. And so this market for the development of new tram systems is rapidly saturated. You know, uh, beginning of the 1900s, uh, barely any city in France that doesn't have a tram. If I go back to, to this uh, figure, 140 systems with a substantial electric tram uh, system by 1906. So the market for new developments is saturated. So these actors that have a stake in developing new tramway systems, they don't have much left to do in France. Uh, there are uh, financial viability problems that already surface for smaller operators. It was a completely unregulated market with all sorts of operators, large and small. There was growing ridership, a lot of enthusiasm for trams but poor maintenance and poor and little stock renewal so already maintenance and repair issues a very heterogeneous network because of the multiple the unstandardized and uh, unregulated uh, uh, market there were some uh, early institutional pressures in the sense that uh, tramway legislation had not been adapted to this new traction so previously horse trams steam trams shortly the electric tram could go much further and much faster, but still they were restricted to, I think it was 25 kilometers an hour. So that sort of limits the attractiveness of it. And there were relational pressures in terms of the actors, and some have called, uh, talked about tramway anarchy because of so many operators, so many tickets. Who do I pay? You know, not, not, not at all a... a um, a harmonized uh, system, very fragmented. Fragmented for riders, for users, but also for suppliers mm -hmm. and the administration. 13 tram operators in Paris. In terms of strategies, so we see it's still a continuous expansion, marginal expansion of the system. This Paris had trams, but it continued to forage into new roads and new uh, lines, and uh, massive electrification uh, um, 
uh, change, technical change. So from horse or steam to electrification. And here you see the overhead electric, electric cable uh, very close to Nation. In terms of institutional uh, uh, strategy, the main push from uh, the authorities was assisting, supporting this, uh, uh, this uh, electrification. But the First World War interrupted this. And so we still, still see, uh, after the war, uh, a lot of places in, in Paris where the tram is not electrified. So you have, still have this, uh, this overlay of multiple tram systems. Uh, General Electric, that uh, built a lot of the tram in, in France, decides because of this market saturation issue to sort of lose interest in developing new tram systems. They're more interested in developing uh, hydroelectric power dams in, uh, in the French Alps, for instance. In terms of Commitment, we see, and this illustrates very well, uh, declining uh, investments in maintenance. So this is the investments in new uh, locomo tram uh, 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 locomotives, if you, if you want, motrice. Uh, and the peak here is 1900, and from there, there on, it uh, substantially uh, declines. So this is, there's a sort of a declining investment and declining interest in, uh, in, uh, in investing in the tram. Uh, there is, however, institutionally, as I mentioned, a commitment to electric tra traction and a, a desire to develop the tram primarily for the poorer uh, social classes in Paris. You have to think that all these neighborhoods around here or uh, behind Nation or in the 20th were complete slums. Uh, and they, uh, and that's what the uh, municipal uh, uh, actors uh, believed, they needed a uh, affordable uh, form of uh, transport. So there's a commitment to that, and Paris is massively expanding in terms of uh, population. Voilà. And I've mentioned that electric companies retreated from uh, the tram and sort of diversified into other kinds of activities. Second period, the pressures. So we have uh, the beginning of uh, substitution competition pressures. So uh, motor buses uh, started to be demonstrated as a potential alternative in the 1920s. Uh, still with some problems, but, uh, but uh, starting to show their face. Um, and there is, I mean, some historians talk about the sort of self-fulfilling pro prophecy because in a way, motor buses enabled the decline of tramways because they competed with tramways, but motor buses also required the tramways. So there's this sort of uh, positive uh, feedback loop uh, at play, a sort of a virtuous or vicious circle, uh, depending on which perspective uh, you take. And there were uh, legitimacy problems, so increasing congestion that's illustrated here with sort of tramways, uh, these clunky tramways. Yes? Yeah, I did not became clear. How did the um, motor bus require the tram? <laughs> ah, because of uh, space in the city. Ah, you know? The big wide streets, that sort of thing? B big wide street. It requires non-cluttered non uh, um, uh, avenues. And, uh, you know, uh, as a comp competitor to substitute uh, a particular mode of transport, uh, you have an interest in the decline of that established one. Well, and, and, and this expansion, this, this secondary legitimacy problem is this expansion, uh, this desire to make uh, trams more affordable, more available for the working classes, meant that they became less appealing to uh, 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 the ruling classes. And they, they, they indeed also uh, uh, removed uh, first class uh, separations, which existed still uh, uh, before the 20s. In terms of strategies, we see, uh, you know, really innovation strategies towards standardizing the tram. So from this chaotic uh, situation where all sorts of of carriages existed, we have a desire to standardize, and this is the L train, this sort of uh, really at that time very modern uh, tramway uh, uh, design. Uh, there's an effort towards re renovating uh, tracks and maintaining them, as well as amalgamating, so trying to uh, rationalize them 
uh, to avoid duplications of tramways that were running parallel, uh, of lines that ran parallel to each other. At the same time, and this is probably the most important element of that period, in 1921 is a restructuring of the organization running, operating the trams. So the ST, STCRP, uh, Société de Transport, uh, uh, um, yeah, the public transport operator of, of uh, uh, Paris, bundles the operations of all these different operators into 112 tramway lines. It also takes on some bus lines. It falls under public ownership. Uh, through the Département de la Seine, which was uh, basically Paris. Uh, and it uh, claims, and it well, writes down in its statutes, a duty to provide trans uh, public transport. So uh, that included in the statutes a, uh, a need to maintain non-profitable lines open because there was this uh, social element, at least in theory. Uh, but the operator, STCRCP, uh, enters in regular conflict with the local authorities that they claim are not funding what is needed to uh, provide an appropriate uh, public uh, transport in the, the form of a, of a public goods, a common, uh, a common. So here, this illustrates uh, still uh, quite some major work done between just two years of amalgamating lines. So uh, from uh, Basically, what is to be seen here is the, where uh, the center of the city was, used to be really these uh, stations where the, the tram started or stopped. Uh, throughway lines uh, started to be built and make this uh, a much more uh, smooth, let's say, system. One question is a little bit off topic, but why, why is Park de Vincent so cramped with tram lines? Ah, because uh, if I go back, this is, uh, you have to remember the tram was not n only an urban transport, it was a peri-urban transport, and Vincennes was the gateway to the, to the east. I'll show you this here. You'll see that much better here. To all the east, southeast, northeast uh, of, of the Paris metro region. Pretty much as Noisy-Champ is now becoming in the frame of the Grand Paris. Okay, in terms of commitments, uh, there, was, there were plans for extrem, express tramways, and this would have been a major salvation for a tram uh, system, so very rapid uh, tramway systems, the rather equivalent to the current RER, uh, but in surface, lighter, uh, and these were abandoned. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of inaction, and inaction is a form of action, so no more investment after 26. Um, and there is uh, gradually a commitment uh, from the municipality and local authorities to free roads from trams. The tram has become a problem, a problem for public uh, and urban authorities in Paris. Um, in terms of commitment to the tram option, we also see inaction. So the public actors did not fight for maintaining accessible public transport, which was its remit, which was its mission. It did not fight back. We don't see much. I mean, there were some commission and some arguments and some, some uh, but it, it's, not, uh, it's not a substantial uh, contestation that we see. And we see from 26, some early attempts to experiment with closing some tram lines. Let's see what, what happens when we close a tram line. And now to my last period, the dismantling of clo closure, and will be extremely rapid. So this closure of tram lines uh, uh, was sometimes backed uh, with uh, replacement by motor buses or temporary replacement by motor buses. And then in 1929, we see a full-fledged program, institutionalized, signed by all the authorities, with a mission to dismantle uh, uh, the tram to get rid of uh, the uh, tram uh, from the face of Paris uh, so as to leave space for motorized transport, cars, motor buses. And then an extremely impressive uh, dismantling rate, 20 lines closed every year. And this is 
not just you know, signing a paper and agreeing to stop a line. It's heavy machinery to remove the tracks, make, you know, it's, it's all combined with the with a urban modernization of the, the streets of Paris. And this just now to illustrate this, the tremendous speed at which uh, this went. Uh, you see here the maps of tramway lines, uh, 26, 30, uh, 33. So 29 is when the program is decided, 30 is when it starts, and then within about six years, Paris has gotten rid of its trams. Voila, so this is the end of the story. Of course, this story is also a story of excitement for the car and excitement for modernity, and trams were sort of a symbol of the backward, or has been framed as a symbol of, of outdatedness and, 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 and past times. Uh, voila. But so how do we explain, in the end, after this story, this very rudimentary story of, of destabilization, how do we explain the decline and the rapid, particularly rapid phase out of the tram in Paris. So I propose to understand it as a long-term destabilization process. We've seen multiple pressures at play, so economic pressures, technical pressures, competition pressures, pressures on legitimacy and the performance of the object itself, and institutional pressures, sometimes active, sometimes just a lack of support. We also see poorly adapted response strategies. Um, and that is very different from what we're seeing today, for instance, in the coal or in the pesticides area. In that case, we see rather little fighting back for a number of reasons. One of them, the electric companies had retreated to other markets, no longer interested in Trump, uh, but also uh, some other reasons. And so when in 1929, the phase out, the you know, formal dismantling program was decided, which you want, might want to see as a heroic kind of uh, political move, in a way the tram was already dead. So you can interpret this as sort of the last nail in the coffin of something that was already, uh, uh, had been already de facto uh, retired. So again, of course, this gives us some clues as to how we can interpret the political pledges today of some countries to phase out coal. You look at the various pledges, most of these countries are countries that have already effectively stopped investing in coal for quite some time and for whom the coal power installations are already uh, on the way out, on the natural rate of, of, uh, of decline, if you want. Um, I think I'm completely out of time. I just wanted to show a couple of how this can be adapted to other kinds of cases, just to show you some of the variety. Uh, again, uh, I wanted to, to illustrate that what's important is that there's no one destabilization pathway, but we can understand a variety of them, variety of ways to break, transform, and end things. Uh, I've shown uh, the French tram case, but there's also other tram cases with other explanations, other uh, speeds, other rates, other uh, uh, mechanisms at play. I've studied uh, the destabilization and decline of coal in the UK, and this was also a particularly rapid, accelerated uh, 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 decline of coal. A very long destabilization period, and then a very abrupt, very political, very socially damaging uh, process, very conflictual one, one that leaves scars to this day. Entire regions in the UK that are still left behind and uh, needing uh, 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 social cohesion uh, investment to uh, 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 remain uh, uh, abreast. I've alluded to the DDT and the, this, this tension between removing, you know, not losing the main target here. Removing one substance can in some cases be seen for these industries as the price to pay to maintain or even expand their activities. So banning a substance does not mean necessarily banning a system. In some cases, it can actually be quite the opposite. I'm going to skip this one because this is quite diff. Well, OK, uh, uh, in, in talks about uh, nuclear phase out, uh, uh, this is very complicated. I really don't have the, the time to do this justice. But what's important is that uh, a number of significant shocks uh, have uh, hit uh, the systems, uh, so 
Uh, we all know about uh, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima. And what is interesting is one might believe that a shock knocks down any system, but we see very different responses in France, in Germany, in the UK to that very a similar shock, of, to that same shock of Fukushima with very different uh, 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 patterns. In France, we see uh, in, uh, the meat under pressure, but not much changing. So this alludes us to a research strategy. We're looking into how the meat lobby is actually fighting back and reframing the object meat. Very illustrative here <laughs> in Interbev, the, the professional association representing beef uh, uh, the beef uh, farmers and transformers, uh, as well as butchers industry in France, has reacted very well to claims of uh, 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 appetite for veganism and uh, flexitarianism, and they label their product as naturally flexitarian. Uh, uh, read this as you may. Uh, another, and that's the last uh, case of significant interest here actually corroborating, or at least in this particular condition, a deep shock. So that's the wine, the Austrian wine industry that has undergone a deep, deep scandal in the 80s. In 86, there was poisoning of wine with uh, um, uh, glycol, which is the antifreeze that you put in cars. And there was, for a set of circumstances that I don't have the detail, to, the time to get into, a very strong reaction from the highest political powers that actually led to a complete transformation of the industry from a wine industry that was rather substandard uh, in Austria in the 80s that was uh, specialized in these uh, sweet wines and, and but, but mostly had table wine in these two liter jugs. We have a whole process in the wake of the crisis of the, eight, of the 86 crisis, a process of uh, uh, developing, framing uh, a, a, a new uh, direction for an industry, an industry based on quality and on qualification of the product and export. And, and I'm sure you've all tasted uh, Austrian wine uh, uh, today because it works really well. As a conclusion, two, small, uh, two short slides uh, on the tram case. So I hope I've uh, illustrated that destabilization at least can be looked through these three Ingredients, pressure fronts, response strategies, and changing commitments. That um, the speed of phase out uh, has to be explained. In this case, it was a very rapid and total decline, but preceded by long term destabilization, a very gradual er erosion. Um, well, and, and, and the last point here is maybe, you know, there is an interaction which I didn't uh, talk that much about. There's an interaction with new things. Motor buses and cars were uh, still essential to the destabilization and phase out of trams. And so now more general uh, conclusions. So, uh, and if these are really the four main points to remember, transitions involve making new things, omelets of varieties of tastes and colors and shapes but also breaking things, okay? Uh, destabilization, this breaking or dealing with the aftermath of breaking things uh, has become a research object. Phase out has become a governance object. You can no longer read a newspaper without hearing about this. And uh, in terms of research strategy, it's, it's extremely relevant, at least I believe, to think in terms of variety of pathways, so typolo typological kinds of thinking about this process. And thank you very much. I hope this was rather clear, not too long.